I said I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back. And then, boom. Hey everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people practical psychology and behavioral analysis on stages and television shows all over the world. This week we are doing part two of the Gwyneth Paltrow case. So for those of you who don't know, Gwyneth Paltrow is currently on trial. Last week we did an analysis where we looked at days one and two, but now we're jumping right into the main testimonies, day four and five. There is a lot going on, a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into it with my very special guest who needs no introduction on this channel. It's Rob from Law & Lumber. Rob, welcome back to the channel. Good to be here. Glad to be here. I don't here even know again. why I say welcome. This is like your channel as much as it's mine at this point. <laughs> it's like a second home. <laughs> so we are looking today at uh, Terry Sanderson, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Eric Christensen. These are the three that we're going to look at, and there's so much stuff here. And for the viewers, we had to get selective. They're, because if we looked at everything where there's something to analyze, this video would have had a runtime of like 10 hours. So we had to be selective. We picked the best stuff. There's certain scenes that I know you guys saw stuff that won't make it into the final edit. But Rob, why don't you start by telling us about really in a quick nutshell for those who aren't following the trial. What is this trial about and who are these three individuals that we're looking at today? Happy to. So February 26, 2016, an incident occurs on Deer Valley Resort. A collision occurs between Terry Sanderson and Gwyneth Paltrow. Terry Sanderson says Gwyneth Paltrow hit him. Gwyneth Paltrow says Terry Sanderson hit her. Terry Sanderson's asking for $3.275 million. Gwyneth Paltrow is asking for a single dollar. It all turns on liability as far as who was the person that struck the other person. Um, and that's kind of where we are. That's the quickest recap I can give. That's wonderful. And who is Eric Christensen? Eric Christensen is a private ski instructor that's employed by Deer Valley. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow has used Mr. Christensen on several occasions in the past, pays several thousands of dollars on each instance when Mr. Sanderson takes her and her kids out to instruct them in a one-on-one -on -one or a, uh, a smaller group setting. Perfect. So we are going to actually start with him. Although in chronological order, he was the last one to go. For this analysis, we're going to get him out of the way first. So we're going to start by looking at moments from Eric Christensen's testimony. Have you personally come across skiers who have collided before? Yes. And just comment on what you've observed. If they're overruled, if they're uh, both in a situation where they each claim they're okay, typically the two skiers part ways and ski off. So a couple of days ago, Spidey and I put out a video. In that video, we analyzed Craig Ramon, who's the plaintiff's chief witness. He's the eyewitness to these events transpiring. And we analyzed his behavior and how he gave his answer. We knew the defense was going to have a witness that contradicted that testimony. That is Mr. Christensen. Specifically, one part of Ramon's testimony that I'm focused on here. Ramon testified that one of the rules of the road was that you never leave an accident. And Mr. Christensen was going to have to face that directly head on. Spidey, did you have any thoughts on this particular bit of testimony? Yeah, so for me, it goes back to that, that kind of binary between these two witnesses. So Craig Ramon was asked, what are the rules of the slopes? And he gave two of the main ones. And then in the third one, he just threw this random rule in without being asked about collisions, about collisions. And we made a whole video about that. Later, we both found out that last year, the rules were changed and that was added. So what you do in the, when a collision happens, stick around, exchange information, that was added last year. But Craig Ramon was talking about seven years ago and he skied most of his life. So it was bizarre that he just would bring this new rule up in that moment. I completely agree with you. I think in this moment, he's confronting directly what the plaintiffs presented, which is you always stick around. He's going, no, you don't always stick around. He's going, if someone from the resort is there and everything's good, you don't have to stick around. Sometimes, you know, people check, is everything okay? And they just take off. That's totally fine. And at the end of the day, we have a skier versus someone who's worked for the last 40 years at a ski resort. So, Who's the jury going to believe? Spidey, did you get the impression based on his response that he knew this question was coming? I think he was prepared for it. And I think he had, like, I think in his head, he kind of 
knew what's what the narrative that's out there and this was one that he was ready to to attack i absolutely do think that because he's putting a bit of emphasis on the whole like you know if everyone's safe then that's fine kind of giving her that caveat that scapegoat i think you're 100 right look at how he addresses this question as opposed to the other questions he comes straight out answers the question and gets interrupted with an objection but the objection doesn't throw him off he doesn't break eye contact and he's ready to answer the question when asked Was Gwyneth upset? Gwyneth was upset. And yes. what, did, what did you observe? As I came across, uh, she was speaking to Mr. Sanderson. Um, once again, the first things I did was to ask if everyone was okay. Did he? Did she yell at him? I don't know that she yelled. I remember her, that she was speaking uh, quite sharply. And but I don't know that, that I would say she yelled. I, I can't recall that. So Rob, something happened right in the beginning there that is related to body language, which is my field, but I feel like this is one of those cases where you'll be as familiar, if not more familiar with this than I am. Because we saw as he was on that stand in that moment of silence while Mr. Owens was thinking of his next question, we saw him look over to Gwyneth Paltrow and we saw a classic gesture. What is that gesture and what does it mean to you? Oh, that gesture to me means, hey, I'm here. I know that I'm here. Hi, Gwyneth. Uh, yeah, I'm on the stand answering questions. Hi. Exactly. And we didn't talk about this. Like, we, legitimately, you knew exactly what that meant without us comparing notes. I have a video on the channel, a short video, where we talk about eyebrow flashes. And my regular viewers know I talk often about eyebrow flashes because there's a lot of research on why we flash our eyebrows. We evolved to have mobile eyebrows because they help us communicate a lot. Eyebrow flashing is something that happens in social greetings pretty much everywhere in the world. You see someone you recognize, hey, how's it going? It shows good intention and it shows like we're connecting here. So that's exactly what that is. It's this moment of social connection like, hey, hey, what's up? Yeah, exactly like you did it. You know, like, hey, I'm here, we're here. How are you? Good to see you. That's exactly right. That's exactly what that was. At the end of this clip, I noticed something with his testimony. It was the reference to speaking. Now, we've heard conflicting testimony on this one. And as of the day we're recording this, that has been reconfirmed via uh, testimony that was given by deposition from Gwyneth Paltrow's two kids. It's in reference to the speaking. Where I noticed this was that Mr. Christensen hesitates in saying the word speaking. As I came across, uh, she was speaking to Mr. Sanderson. And I didn't know if there was any more to read from that part, and that's why I wanted to ask you. Yeah, that's the exact reason that clip is in here. That's why I left that part in, so great catch. Um, it's called psychological distancing. Sometimes you ask a guilty party about a murder, and they'll say something like, I never touched that person. I would never hurt that person as opposed to murder because it's such a, it's a heavy word that paints a heavy image. And we're talking about right now, the image that stays in our head. And it's pretty clear that she was screaming at him. She herself said she was screaming at him. She apologized on the stand for being rude and screaming at him. So it's pretty clear. And you could see him here trying to like dodge and pick his words right, which is the hesitation you caught because he doesn't want to paint this picture of her being vicious in that moment. He kind of wanted to make, because he said speaking. Now we know what the words were. The words were, you ran into my effing back. You don't speak that. Those aren't words that you speak. Excuse me, kind sir, you may have, you know, run into my effing back. Like it's just not something that happens. So yeah, I think he's using language to make this seem like it, she wasn't furious in that moment. Which kind of, for me, brings me to my conclusion on Christensen. Last week, we talked about Craig Ramon, and then we made a follow-up video talking about Craig Ramon, and it would only be fair to look at both these witnesses under the same light. Um, and if we do that, for me, they kind of cancel each other out. Because we talked about how Craig Ramon has certain things that he's presenting a certain way to really make it seem like Gwyneth Paltrow was the bad guy, but we're here seeing things that Christensen is doing to make it seem like she's the good guy. So last week you used a word that I loved. You said a preferred outcome. Is that what you said, preferred outcome? I think so. Or desired outcome, preferred outcome? Yeah, it was, it was describing bias. It's not so much a bias as someone having a desired outcome to the case. 
Right. So I think in this case, Christensen has a desired outcome. He's not a employee of the resort who's here to testify as a completely objective angle to say, here's what I saw. He's presenting this in a way that shows favoritism towards Gwyneth Paltrow. Would you agree? I would, I would. Okay, so now the witnesses have kind of ruled each other out. So what we have to go on is the testimony of the plaintiff and the defendant themselves. And that's what we're gonna jump into right now. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. How often would you ski? Two to three times per week. Okay. For how many years? Well, I started 37 years ago. And in all of your years, other than the ski collision with Ms. Paltrow, have you ever been in another ski accident? Never, never. Okay, so now Terry Sanderson, the plaintiff, is on the stand. And Rob, I saw while we were watching that, that it, it irked you. And I think it wasn't even as a lawyer or as an analyst. It was as someone who spent a lot of time on slopes. We both have, ever since we were children. I will never believe that someone who has skied for years has never had an accident. That's the word he used, never. That's an absolute word. He goes on later to criticize absolute words. And never for me, like, had he said something like, never this bad, or, you know, I've had a couple of falls, or, you know, I've, I've hit a couple of trees or something like that, slipped on a couple of ice patches, but nothing to this scale, fine, maybe. But when you say that absolute never, plus in an area where, there are a lot of skiers. So it's likely that the jury members have some experience on the slopes. To me, I think it immediately puts goggles on people to say, mm, I'm not so sure I believe this person. Right in the beginning on something very silly. Plus, was there, did I make this up? Was there evidence of him having actually had an accident? You did not make that up. First of all, never use absolutes when you're testifying in front of a judge, jury, et cetera. Once you're placed under oath, be very careful with the words you're using. Absolutes are dangerous, especially with lawyers, especially when we have prior testimony. I believe he even acknowledges it later that he objectively has been involved in an incident. Now, it might not have related to another skier. There might not have been a collision, but it did result in him being injured for a period of time. Skiing is inherently dangerous as a sport. Every person who's been on skis or snowboard has had some run-in, whether it's a tree, ice, something. You've had an accident. Don't say never. You can't. It's, it's impossible for there never to be an incident on a ski slope. How well did you know, Craig, at the time um, back Febu February 2016? Did you guys hang out a lot before this you know, collision? Um, of course, at lunch, we spent time together. And there may be an, a couple of other occasions where we met with him, but usually there was somebody else there um, along with us. Okay. So not I don't remember being exclusive with him. All right. So, Terry. Spotty, this clip is all you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, so, yeah, um, cluster of deception. Now, we're going to talk about cluster of deception today quite a few times. So I want to give the deception disclaimer. So nobody on this planet can look at behavior and tell you if someone is lying. The reason for that is simple. There isn't a single thing that all humans do when they're being deceptive. There are things we all do when we're excited, when we're happy, when we're angry, that looks the same on every human. There's nothing we all do when we're being deceptive. What we do know about deception is that in a lot of cases, liars are more stressed than truth tellers. Liars are trying to present a narrative that they care about more than most truth tellers who are just trying to give you the facts. And liars are thinking more than most truth tellers because truth tellers just have to recount the facts, that's it. So typically we look for two things. We look for clusters, so behaviors that happen all at the same time, and we look for baseline. These behaviors have to deviate from someone's baseline. It has to be something they don't normally do. Because if I point out something and you're thinking, wait, I do that all the time when I'm not lying, that's fine, that's your baseline. So in this case, we have a really decent cluster of deception. And I think it's simple. He's trying to underplay how close he is with Craig because he knows that if the jury thinks they're like best friends, it's going to compromise Craig Ramon's testimony. So what do we have? When he starts his answer, we get a lot of fluff. We get a lot of words that we usually pay a lot of attention to how quickly you get to an actual answer. And he's got, you know, um, of course, before he actually starts talking. This is fluff. Typically, we see this as a method to buy time to think of an answer. Because remember, typically liars 
are really focusing on how do I present the best answer here? Truth tellers typically don't care about that kind of thing. We get a quick lip lick right in the middle of that. Um, right at the end, right at the end of his answer, notice how he straightens up a little and you kind of, you see him, we call this posturing and we call this grooming. He's fixing his appearance. And this is very important for a cluster of deception. He doesn't do this very often, but he's doing it here. And typically this is because we've just said something that we want the person to buy. So we're trying to make ourselves look more presentable so that they'll believe us a little bit more. Then as he says the word exclusive, which I find hilarious because the question wasn't, are you guys seeing anyone else at the moment? Like he goes, we're exclusive. No one asked you if you're exclusive. You were just asked like, were you friends before this? And he's really going into these details of how, well, we never hung out alone and that's a non-answer. Nobody asked you if you're exclusive. Nobody asked you if you hung out alone. So that was disastrous. And Rob, you actually spotted this. As he's saying exclusive, now Terry Sanderson does have a pretty high blink rate, but during that word exclusive, we get this burst of like, bam, 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 bam. The, the, the blink rate just shoots up like crazy. I wouldn't call it quite a flutter, but it goes really fast for that period of time. And this is something that's consistent with stress. Does this mean that I know for a fact that he's being deceptive here? No, but based on my experience, I would wanna ask a few more questions here because I think he's misrepresenting, I personally think, how close him and Craig were. I think they were quite more friendly than he's trying to represent here. Out of the park. <laughs> Should I go run the bases and come back? Go do that. Okay. Go do that. Just the whole time. Bye. <laughs> okay, everyone. So buckle up because now we're going to actually go into when he's asked to tell the story of what happened that day, how that accident ended up happening. Spidey, I, I don't know that I have this in me. I, <laughs> do we have to, is it the whole thing? The whole story? No, okay. So no, I'm going to cut it down. So listen, guys, I'm going to leave a link in the description to go watch the live stream of this. I will cut it down because I still want you guys to get an idea of all these different things he talked about before we got to the actual accident because it is important behaviorally. So Rob, I'm so sorry, but I'll condense it. We'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll shorten it. Take the jury through what happened in this ski collision. Take it from say getting off of the lift. Yes. Happy to do that. Um, it was really, a very nice day for skiing and I was really looking forward to it. And of course, Kirelli has amazing groomed runs. Found that out right away. So I was on a chair with um, probably four people. I think uh, Joanne, Debbie, um, Craig, and there could have been another person besides myself. So I start, I went right down the run and started just making nice soft turns and um, staying within that boundary. It could have been as much as five yards wide, but it might've been more like five or six feet. Um, all of a sudden in front of me is two big signs. I've never seen that big of slow down signs. And I could see about half of the, I don't know if it's a montage or the empire, could about half of that beautiful building. And it and takes my breath away to think I, this is hard because I, I don't like going through this scene. I, I just remember Everything was great, and then I heard something I've never heard at a ski resort, and that was a blood-curdling scream. Just, I can't do it. It was, ah, and then, boom. And it was like somebody was out of control and going to hit a tree and was going to die. And that's what I had until I was hit. That's what was going on in your mind. Overruled. That's what's going on in your mind when you hear that scream. App, that was instantaneous. Oh my gosh, somebody's out of control. And they're really seriously out of control. Not time for a hockey stop. I didn't go think about that, but most people could avoid that, I think. Okay, Rob, we're going to talk about it in just a sec. I'm with you, man. But before we do, I need to do a second really quick disclaimer. And here's what it is. Studies have shown that People who are telling the truth but fear not being believed behave very much in the same way as people who are being deceptive. The reason is simple. Once the person thinks that you're not going to believe them, now they're trying to sell their narrative, which is what liars often do. So it's very hard to distinguish between those two things. Furthermore, this event is very different from other things we've covered. If you're watching someone on trial for murder, 
they either murdered or they didn't. This accident happened. We know it happened. So there's a lot of things that are going to be real in the story of the party that's being dishonest. And the only thing where it's going to be dishonest is that moment where the hit happened. But everything else is real. They're not trying to hide what they were doing in the case of like a theft or a murder. They're not trying to hide what they did that entire evening. It's just that one second who hit whom. So let's keep that in mind. That being said, Rob, this is the Rob grenade. The pin is released. Go. Okay, so first, he begins telling the story not where his attorney directs the story. Attorney says, tell the story when you get off the ski slope, when you get off the chair. Mm, that's not good enough for him. He wants to backtrack a little bit and talk to you about who's on the chair with him. I don't mind it. It's not terrible. Then he starts to describe his ski, and this was something I caught right away. When he starts to say he starts smoothly making passes, look at his chair. He's skiing. To me, it's clearly not intentional. He's really putting himself in that moment. The swivel is too natural as it comes to him. And then when he sees the signs, you can actually kind of see his hands remain down as if he's holding ski poles, and he looks up at these big grand signs. And that, that is about as far as I got because the next part's going to make me really frustrated, and I might, I might need. I got uh, you, buddy. I got I you. I might need a minute. Help me. I got you. Just, just relax. I got you. I got you. Just think happy thoughts. Um, so, first of all, let's talk about story structure really quick. This is in other ones of my videos, so I'm not going to go deep into this, but there is a way that truth tellers typically structure stories, and there's a way that people who are embellishing typically uh, structure stories. Truth tellers typically, the way it goes is this. Every story has three parts. Prologue, main event, epilogue. So, what happened before, the event itself, what happened after. Truth tellers typically, again, typically, will spend very little time on the prologue. They set the scene, enough for you to understand what's happening. Then the main event is what they want to tell you about. So they tell you about it. They take the most time on the main event. And then they'll give you an epilogue, what they thought afterwards, what was coursing through their head afterwards. People who are being deceptive, that shifts typically. They spend a lot of time on the prologue. Why? Because they're, this is where they can be honest. So to convince you that they're honest, they actually spend a lot of time on the thing you know, they give you all these details. It was a beautiful day. I was doing this. I was going here because it's these things happened. So it's their opportunity to sell their honesty to you. Then the main event gets confusing, sometimes quick, sometimes glossed over. They just want to get past it. That's the part that they don't want you to get too many details on. So it's kind of breeze over it. Plus, they feel like they already put some truth credits in the bank with the prologue so they can kind of breeze over it. And you rarely get an epilogue because they can't tell you what they thought about after the event. The event never happened. Now, in this case, it's a little tricky. You're likely to get an epilogue, even if the person's being deceptive, because the accident did happen, whether it was their fault or not. So we're going to ignore the epilogue. That being said, the prologue in this case does not make any damn sense. Now, I know I said we have to consider baseline, and Terry's baseline is often to go into insane amount of details, but this one is more insane than any of the other narratives he's given so far or will proceed to give. It takes him an eternity to get to the main event. And I cut it down. He talks about, like you said, Rob, he goes back to the beginning of the day. If he was here to tell this jury what happened, he would rush to get to that accident. That's why he's here. So all this stuff he's saying, he's setting the scene. Now, here's what's crazy about what you pointed out. He's illustrating. He's stepping into that moment. I'm skiing. I'm doing my curves. I see the billboard. But what happens when he talks about the accident? First, he says, I hear this scream. I can't do it, but and he does it. Nobody asked you to do it. What do you, you know, if you say, I heard a scream, we get what a scream is. He's really trying to sell this narrative. But then what happens? He goes, and then, boom. What's this boom? If, if you had to assume, I mean, are we, we, we all assume when he said boom, that he was talking about the accident, that he was talking about the moment he was hit, right? Right. Right. But then he goes back to auditory. And he goes, it sounded like someone was going was gonna to die or hit a tree. But what, what, are you, what are you doing? What was the boom then? And then he goes, that's what I had until I was hit. What does that mean, that's what you had until you were hit? Wasn't that the boom? So what's going on here? And then, boom. And it was like somebody was out of control and going to hit a tree and was going to die. And... That's what I had until I was hit. He's setting the scene, and then we have this really confusing main event. 
he's stepping into the memory when he's skiing, right? We're seeing him do those curves. He's stepping into the memory when he's looking at the billboard. But at the moment where he talks about the accident, look at, it, look at his illustrators. There's nothing that suggests him reliving that moment. I was hit. I was hit. He does this, which is like, what is this? An outside perspective of somebody looking at it from the side and then goes back to talk about sliding and almost hitting a tree, you know, and then, and then goes, that's what I had until I was hit. What did you have? But none of it in that moment am I seeing him in any way act out being hit. For someone who illustrates what he's experiencing, I'm not getting this, here's what happened. So, sorry, it's for me, the way this is structured, the way I feel like this is a sales pitch, we often say, uh, truth tellers tell, liars sell. For someone who spent so much time with all the details leading up to it, we're getting very confusing stuff here. The details are gone. Do you feel like he might have added, meaning that when he gave his first sales pitch on the blood curdling scream and bam, do you feel like he might have added and gone back because he didn't think the impact was resonating? in that first telling? I think it's very likely. I think it's very likely that he did the boom and he goes, no, no, wait, I can do this better. And he goes back and he edits and he tries it again. When you're in this moment and you're telling the story and you're not concerned with how it's coming off, you just lay the facts in order, that's it. This rewind he's doing is so bizarre, jumping along the timeline, it's very strange. You know, I got hit in my back so hard and it, I, I'm right at my shoulder blades and it felt like, and was, perfectly centered and the, the fists and the poles were right there at the bottom of my shoulder blades. Serious, serious smack. Never been hit that hard and I'm flying. I'm absolutely flying. Now, you're not airborne. Well, it. all I saw was a whole lot of snow and I didn't see the sky, but I was flying in that sense. And then I thought about the crowd on the left and I thought, I don't know who's wanted over there and I do not want to get them mixed up in here. And I've heard, you know, um, that maybe that's not decided about how my ribs really got hurt. I absolutely lurched with what little I could off of my skis a little bit more to the right to keep, to make sure nobody over here got involved on my left side. Did the person who struck you land on top of you? I wouldn't know that. I absolutely would not know that. I was just surprised. I had no upper body strength enough to be able to catch myself. I had no idea. All right, so with this clip, we see something that caught my attention right away. The attorney cuts him off, and there's a flash of frustration that he shows in that moment. The reason why the attorney cuts him off is that he starts illustrating that he went flying. He went flying. He does a little Superman pose as he's doing it. Here's the problem. The attorney knows that none of the evidence in the record supports that he was airborne at any point in time during this. In fact, I believe their own experts stipulated that he did not go airborne at any point in time. So the attorney is trying to correct him. He's in the moment and trying to narrate and you see him get a little bit defensive. But I'm more curious about what you saw in the rest of that clip. I found that to be quite strange, but not as strange as him saying that with, with a lot of certainty that he knows that he was hit on the back with fists and poles. Listen, when you're skiing, and again, Rob, I have to go back to the fact that we've both been doing this ever since we were very young. You're wearing layers, you're wearing a thick jacket. When something hits you, you don't know what hit you. It happens all very fast. I've been hit, I've been wrecked on the slopes again and again, and not one time, not one, unless it was a tree or a rock, there's not one time that I could tell you specifically which body part from someone hit me. It's impossible. It happens way too quick. So this is again him trying to sell a narrative. He can't possibly know that, especially because he goes on to be asked, did the person land on top of you? And he doesn't know. So the guy who has the capacity to sense fists and pulls with his back, doesn't know if there's a whole nother human on his back, that's extremely inconsistent. If you know the one thing, you know the other thing. Finally, and I'm, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry if I'm gonna laugh while I say this, I'll try not to. He, it's like he's describing something out of a superhero movie where everything, you know, pauses, and the superhero is like walking you through the thought process. He literally says that, he consciously made the decision to change, <laughs> to change his course mid-flight 
the land of the right to not hurt other skiers. No, that like you, you know, no. Let's let's trust your narrative for a moment. Suppose you're airborne. By the time you realize what's happening, it's too late to change course. You're not Superman. So, and even if you didn't take off, even if you're still on the ground, when you're falling in an accident, especially if you're blindsided, you're thinking one thing: don't die. There are a lot of elements of this testimony that reminded me a lot of Amber Heard, specifically when she also said that she felt a, a, a boot on her back when she was kicked, which in this case, with the layers, with the skiing, you're much less likely to know what hit you on the back. But in either case, when that trauma happens, you're not registering specifics. You would say something hit me. Then when you went on to describe this whole in-flight you know, course correction thing, that reminds me of Amber Heard when she alleged that Johnny Depp threw her across the room and they both went flying and landed on a table. Remember that one? For this to have happened, the Hulk would have had to like uppercut him from behind and then, and then mid-flight he would have had to develop you know, abilities to... I, listen, what he's... And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to Terry. If this truly happened and I'm being condescending in any way, uh, I'm sorry. But it's the way you're describing this. It does not make any sense. I've said it before and it bears repeating. Your story is enough. Don't add to it. By adding to it, you end up taking away from it. You take away from your credibility. Your credibility is all that you have. Adding to your story is a red flag to a lot of people. And then Craig said to me, as I remember, of course, I'm, my brains are a little bit stretched out of place. And, and I, I, re, I remember um, him saying, do you know who you are? And what I thought I said was, oh my gosh, I can feel this pathway in my brain. It's going around and trying to figure out who I am. And yes, I know I'm Terry. And then he said, um, do you know where you are? And I said, I know I'm skiing, but I don't know where I am. And that's when the man in green took off. Rob, this one's gonna be really simple and really quick. Uh, we're just gonna ignore the whole pathways in my brain thing because I don't even know what to do with that. Wait, why, 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 why are you skipping past this, the mental synapses connecting and that that's the thought process? How are you just gonna fly past that? Because I don't, I, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? Be spidey. That it makes no sense whatsoever. That hey, someone that, that, is mentally processing what's going on in their brain. They're going, hang on. I just felt electricity pass from one lobe of my brain to the other. That's what must be happening in this moment. Yeah, it, yeah but it's just another thing in a sea of things that don't make sense. So, so for me, it's just like, it's like do, do we need to reiterate that, that he's just saying these random things? But okay, you're right. Yeah, it, it's very bizarre. But here's my main thing with this one. He's describing this line of questioning as having happened at the site. And if you go back and look at the whole testimony, he says it happened right at that moment after the crash at that spot. In Craig Ramon's testimony, unless I misremembered this, and I'm hoping you can help me out here, I distinctly remember him saying that they skied off a little bit, and then he asked him for his name, and then he asked him, do you know where you are? And this happened. I'm just thinking, it's an easy run, let's just get down to the bottom of the hill, and we'll deal with it then. And, uh, and so, then, uh, so then we start going down, down the hill, and he's really having a hard time going. So he ends up pulling over to, to the right side, and then I came, came uh, next to him, and I was, I was like, Terry. Um, I didn't say Terry. I, I said, do you know your name? And, he's, and he goes, Terry. So what he's describing here is having happened on the site, uh, uh, Craig Ramon described as being elsewhere later. Yes. Just want to point that there's a massive inconsistency there. Really quick before we move on, he also says, as I remember, because my brain is stretched out, you know, I, I like trying to represent like he can't really remember. How convenient that his memory seems to step in and out when, 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 when it serves him. Because earlier he had no trouble remembering what a beautiful day it was and what the slopes looked like and the signs and I was skiing like this. We get mountains of detail. He got hit in the back with fists and poles. And now all of a sudden, oh, I, you know, I'm sorry, my brain is stretched out, I can't remember. I'm, for me, it's a massive red flag when 
there's fluctuating capacities to remember. And I get it, there was a trauma there. I get that they're alleging that he has, you know, brain damage, but don't claim that you're having a hard time remembering that day when you just gave us a ton of details about what happened earlier that day. So it's not a huge red flag, but I'm not a fan of this fluctuating um, memory capacity. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense, yeah. Terry, did you cause the ski collision with Ms. Paltrow? Absolutely not. I swear to my God and my family, my other father in heaven, it's like, no, no, I did not. Why? Spidey, this is something we see a lot of, especially in court cases and in interviews. And I have a question for you. Does it mean anything to you when someone either evokes religion or the passing of a parent or they swear on a grave or the Bible or the Quran or whatever instrumentality they wish to swear upon? Does that mean anything to you? It's a terrific question. So there are a lot of analysts out there who will include invoking religion as part of a cluster. Uh, there are others who just put it with qualifiers. Qualifiers are anything that qualify or add weight to your statement. So things like honestly, to tell the truth, again, out of baseline. So if we look at it here, he hasn't said I swear to God or anything like this th that I recall anywhere else in the testimony. So it's happening here, it's off baseline. We're getting that hesitation. We're getting, he's coming to life a little, he's a little more animated, his pitch is a little bit higher, so there's enough going on here for me to be curious about this religion thing. So here's the way I look at it. Invoking religion for me makes sense for a truth teller in one of two circumstances. The first one is if you express that you don't believe them about something. So let's say I tell you, Rob, that yesterday I uh, traveled from New Jersey to Montreal, I came home, I had dinner, and then I went to bed rather early. And you say, I don't believe that you were in Jersey yesterday. I might go, no, I swear to God, I was, I was in Jersey in the morning. So as a response to your skepticism, not so odd. The second circumstance is something that I think is likely that you won't believe. For example, you know I sleep late. So if I went to bed yesterday early and I say something like, I had dinner and then Rob, I was so tired, I swear to God, I went to bed. That kind of makes sense because I know that you wouldn't normally believe that that's the time I sleep at. There it makes sense. However, let's say I told you, um, I took a flight home yesterday from New Jersey and then I swear to God I had dinner and then I went to bed. Doesn't that sound weird there? Yeah. Like why are you swearing to God there? So for me when it's just dropped into something that's just an answer, it's suspicious. So in this case, I know we're on Terry's case here. In this case, I'm not seeing a massive cluster. Like I said, there are a few things. And let's remember that he's on trial because he knows that there's a lot of people out there who don't believe him. So to say, I swear to God, no, we often see this in games of deception. Uh, mafia, werewolf, among us, when someone's accused and they go, guys, I swear to God, it's not me. Because they know that people aren't believing them. So there are times where I take note of that. This isn't one of them. In fact, there was a clear denial here and then he invoked religion. Honestly, this denial to me felt better than a lot of the rest of what he's been doing. You know, there was like this, it's almost like it can look deceptive, but it can also just look like someone who really wants to be moving and going, no, I, listen, I swear to God, I don't know what to tell you, I didn't do this. Because we get a direct denial. So let us know in the comments. What do you think of that? By the way, you've hurt, hurt yourself before skiing, true? Never, but, needing, never needing help, right? You before this up. incident, though, you injured your knee. I had when I first learned to ski that first year. All right. Beaver. Mm -hmm. So did you tell Eric Christensen, according to his report, that she appeared right in front of me? Yes or no? No. No. So he just never. made that up? Must have. Deer because Valley just uh, uh, falsified a record. Is that your opinion? I never would have said that. I knew where it came from. You're at the clinic. You take a picture. This is at this on, on the Deer Valley Hill. You take a picture of Ramon and one of the other skiers, and they're all smiles. Did you know that? Um, boy, that's... A little bit, a little bit. I do kind of remember that. Uh -huh. Can you bring up the picture of Ramon? I do. Uh, do you recognize that you took this picture? I recognize the picture and I probably did take it. All yeah. right. Smile, you know.
Steve Owens, I've been critical of him and I'm going to continue to be somewhat critical of him because I don't know how long the clip was that it took for you to stitch that into, but it must have been longer than 10 minutes because he takes a roundabout way to get to the question. Now, when he gets there, when he gets there on some of these questions, he makes the point. And a lot of these questions, especially the ones that you highlighted here, he's making a good point. And it's a point where that level of sarcasm or snark, whatever you want to call it, is appropriate because it's he's got Terry Sanderson boxed in. We mentioned it earlier in this video about the uh, I've never had an accident. And then there's the perfect amount of snark that's raised in that question. Well, you've had an incident before. And you hurt your knee, didn't you? And you see Terry Sanderson get uncomfortable. So I'm withholding judgment on Owens. There's a lot of whining and complaining, a lot of argument that comes at inappropriate times. But uh, when he gets into the questions, especially during cross-examination, he can make some points, as we've illustrated here. Now, from a behavioral standpoint, Spidey, did you see anything in this series of clips that you wanted to highlight? I did. Later, we're going to see Gwyneth Paltrow be asked about Craig Ramon, the plaintiff's witness. And, you know, if what he's saying is not true, was he lying? And we're going to take a look at what her answer is. But in this case, Terry Sanderson is given that same opportunity. He's asked uh, about Eric Christensen. Did he, did he make that up? And his answer is, he must have. Not, yeah, not, well, that, that's like not what happened. It's a weak denial. It's, he must have made that up. Now, Rob, if I, if something happened that you know happened, and I tell you that there's this other person who says that didn't happen, something else happened, did he make that up? You'd go, yeah, he made that up. That's not what happened. Then he's asked, so what, the resort is just lying? And, he, and his answer is, I never would have said that. Not, I never said that. I didn't say that. I never would have said that. Again, that's a weak denial. So I'm not seeing here a conviction, him saying, yeah, that's, this is your chance. This is your chance. There was a witness up there who was quite credible in a lot of ways, who works at the resort, who said this whole thing. Here's your chance. All the stuff you said about what a beautiful day it was and the size of the billboards, this is your chance to be like, he made this up, he made that up, that doesn't make sense. This is your chance to get on him. But instead you're saying, he must have. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like this would have been a time for him to like really go after and go, no, that couldn't have happened. And reiterate and reiterate the way someone else is going to do. Do you agree with that? That you would have liked to see a little bit more of a certain denial? 100%. And I can guarantee you that his attorneys are feeling the same way. When I have a client on the stand, I don't want them to waffle. I want them to be firm in their convictions. I can deal with that. I can argue that. I can argue emphatically that the words coming out of Mr. Owen's mouth were suggestive to try and throw my client off. And he came back with a response that, yes, said that these things were misstatements. I want the actual statement. Give me the denial. Give me the, you're a liar. You told the truth. If you're going to say that the words out of your mouth were true and someone else is lying, say that. Don't wish wash. It's the other personality that's inhabiting my body right now. And you blame Gwyneth Paltrow for that? Yes. No question. Do you recall having a kind of a stroke event? <laughs> yep. I mean, there's... I love it. I'm sorry. I'm so, I don't know if I'm going to get... I love it. No, like, I love it. He's saying things that would maybe get an objection without actually saying them. Yeah. Yeah. There's really not much to say. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a look is a thousand words. Same. Owens, same. You know, you, me, same. Yeah. Listen, I, I, yeah, there are times where he's been irritating, but this was like, without saying anything, the guy goes, you, you blame Gwyneth Paltrow for that? And he goes, yeah, and just, like, all that's missing is like a... <clears throat> But he's saying it. He's just like he's holding back laughter. Like, that's ridiculous. And notice how he doesn't say, my client. He goes, Gwyneth Paltrow? Like, Gwyneth pa You know, because like we hear crazy people like blame celebrities for things like, oh, Brad Pitt is stealing from me. No, no, no. So he goes like, oh, so Gwyneth Paltrow is the reason that you're, you're, you know, have a second personality. It's interesting how he chooses to use her full name as opposed to my client or Miss Paltrow. Well, and to be honest, this is out of baseline for him because for the majority of the other times he references her, it's always my client. Very rarely does he actually say her name. 
I absolutely believe it's by design. Again, because like by saying her full name, it makes him sound crazy. Like Gwyneth Paltrow is, is in your head. Ramon, although he did uh, try to change his deposition, did say that at one point you said, I'm okay. Do you dispute it? I dispute it. Now, I never to dispute felt okay. it, you have to know everything you said, right? Like, I know everything I said, and I didn't say it. Are you saying you have a perfect memory of what you said on that hill just after the collision? Yes or no? I knew. That's not argumentative. That's not argumentative. O overruled? Yes or no? Well, that word is so ultimate, perfect. No. Right. An answer would be no, it's not perfect. Okay. So it's possible you said, for instance, Eric Christensen is going to testify, first witness this afternoon, that you told him, I'm okay. Do you dispute it? I dispute it. Okay. I never felt safe and like anybody was there to help me. And then I he, would not have said it. He's a Rob, first of all, what is an argumentative objection? I don't understand what that means. So why was she objecting and why was it overruled? What, what happened there? So an argumentative object, or objection argumentative means that the person isn't asking a question. They are instead using the opportunity that's being given to them to ask a question to make a statement or make an argument. The question Owens is giving here, he gives that first question and then he goes into this summary or description. Now you're allowed a little bit of latitude in describing the question you're about to give, but you're not allowed to persuade the person or the jury that's hearing the answers, how they should interpret the question being given. Owens kind of oversteps here. Now he gets the objection overruled and is allowed to ask the question, but I think that's because the objection came too late. But I know that you liked this question because it 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 triggered a psychological boxing in of Mr. Sanderson, right? You know me so well. I thought psychologically, legally, I, I understand what you're saying, kind of. Uh, but psychologically, I think it's a great question because it basically says there are only two options. Either you remember everything, which no one's going to believe, and if you if that's what you're saying, then you don't really have that much brain damage, or you remember nothing, which puts everything you've said into question. So it's 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 a double bind. It's you, either option is no good because how is he supposed to answer that? And he kind of gets him there, and he goes, "Yeah, well, you know, I don't like absolute. I don't like perfect. Oh, since when you don't like absolute, Mister Never?" Mr. I've never, never, ever, never, never had an accident, you know? So now, now we don't like absolutes. And I love it. We did full, full circle. We're right back at the beginning where in the beginning he used an absolute. He's never had an accident. That was incorrect. But now, you know, I don't like, I don't like absolutes. So yeah, no, I guess my memory isn't perfect. And he's just poked a hole. He's poked a hole in this yacht and it's going down because now the jury in their head, there's that little virus that's going, okay. So he doesn't remember everything. We have to take everything he says with a grain of salt. Yep. And now you see the value of an attorney when they're playing defense, when they're determining when and how to object, because that question would not have been asked had the objection come earlier. So this is really important in trials because the witness evidence, the testimony you see is a result of the questioner, the person that's playing defense to the questions and the witness that's testifying in response. To be fair, maybe the reason they didn't object is because very politely in his opening, he said, can we keep interruptions to a minimum? <laughs> God. Don't make me relive that. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, the big one, Gwyneth Paltrow. So we're going to look at her testimony and we're going to pay a lot of attention to how is it different? How is it different from what we saw with Terry Sanderson? Starting with this. Isn't it true that your kids wanted to watch you ski? or pardon me, that the, the kids wanted you to watch them ski. Isn't that true? And your, your counsel, he objected. How did you answer that question? But let's read the objection, Your Honor, if we're gonna do this. The objection was vague as to time. I said I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back by someone. And then you continued. Which is what happened. Exactly. So you were watching your children when you alleged that you were ski skied directly into your back by someone. Uh, my eyes were not fixated only on my son okay. when Mr. Sanderson skied directly into my back. Okay. And so when Miss Oaks, who's going to testify next week, said that your son Moses was saying, Mommy, Mommy, watch me, that's who you were looking at when you were, direct, when, when you were skied directly into your back. I 
do not recall Moses saying, Mommy, Mommy, watch me on the ski slope. And that's where your attention was when you were hit, allegedly, in the back. I don't know where my attention was the moment I was struck in the back. I'm sorry. Okay, well, that's what you said, which is what happened. He struck me in the back. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Okay, I know, but you said, I can still watch my children ski. Yes, and meaning... Directly it, into my back by someone, which is what happened. Yes, exactly. What's the, what's the pending question? It sounds like they're saying the exact same thing. So right off the bat, we see something that you and I both picked up on when we first started looking at Ms. Paltrow in the earlier video. And I asked you a question about a lot of the eye blinks here. Did you want to elaborate on baseline and discuss any of that? Yes, sir. So a lot of people are talking about her blink rate, the fact that she's blinking like crazy. A lot of people are talking about her lip pursing, how we constantly see this kind of this kind of thinning of the lips, like this almost like this duck face. A lot of people are talking about her lip retractions. Every now and then we see this, this kind of thing. A lot of people are talking about her eyebrows. Her eyebrows keep going up and down. And here's the bottom line. This is her baseline. It's happening throughout the entire thing from the moment she sits down, whether she's answering stressful questions or normal questions or talking about anything, it's happening constantly. Furthermore, if you go look at other interviews of her, high blink rate is not uncommon for her. It happens a lot. So why is it happening? It doesn't matter. A lot of people jump to conclusions. Oh my God, look at how much she's blinking. She must be lying. It doesn't mean anything. It's happening the entire time. Now, if she wasn't doing that, if she's just sitting there answering questions and all of a sudden this stuff starts to happen, we would have a problem. I would want to ask more questions. Again, I, you can never know someone's being deceptive, but that would be sus. But that's not happening. It's just the entire time. So yeah, you can't really look into that. And there's a part of me like thinking like, did she watch behavioral analysis videos? You know, she knew she was gonna be on trial. She wanted to see what to expect on YouTube. And it's like, oh, so these guys look for blink rate and pursed lips and eyebrow flashes. Well, here we go. Here's another thing I want to talk about right now. A lot of people are saying on, on you know, comments and things like that, like, I really don't like her. I don't like her attitude. She must be lying. We have to make a distinction. Just because we don't like someone, it doesn't mean they're lying. In fact, if you don't like someone, especially Gwyneth Paltrow, right? She's an actress. She's played a lot of roles where she was very likable. If she wanted to be likable, she knows more or less what efforts she can make a little bit to make herself more likable. She's not making that effort at all. Do you know why? Because she doesn't care what you think of her. So for me, if I'm looking at someone, I go, I'm not liking their vibe. Now, there's some cases where I don't like a vibe because I feel like they're being fake or they're exaggerating. That's different. If I'm looking at someone, I'm going, I just don't like their vibe. They're being cold. They're being dismissive. They really don't care about this. That's not a reason to think she's lying. Again, remember, liars very often care about how they come off. So let's make that distinction. I don't love Gwyneth Paltrow, I don't hate Gwyneth Paltrow, but that should never play into whether you think she's being deceptive or honest. Here we're getting a lot of really direct answers. And Rob, talk to us about what's happening in this line of questioning. Some really interesting stuff is going on where I think there's a miscommunication and it's not making her nervous at all. That's really funny because you mentioned behavioral analysts on YouTube and whether Ms. Paltrow watched them. I can tell you who didn't watch them and it's likely Mr. Sanderson's attorney because she's really not doing a great job here on cross-examination. The questions that she thinks are owns or the questions she thinks are slam dunks are not slam dunks. She's not listening to the answers being given and it results in a lot of very weird responses. The attorney has this response of exactly like it's some whole gotcha moment, but really it doesn't ring true. If anything, when I hear her say exactly, it's almost like an exclamation point on Gwyneth Paltrow's narrative. I know there's a lot in this that you want to talk about, but honestly, with this one, I just felt pure frustration from the attorney. When the objection happens, the earlier objection, when Gwyneth Paltrow has been asked to read what she said as a response, we see her look down, read the response. We see the moment she realizes that she's about to slam this question, shut it down. And we see that moment because we see a smile on her face and at the same moment we hear it on the mic, she laughs to herself because she's like, the, I'm about to, she, she knows how to present this. The objection was vague as to time. Then she goes, I can watch my children and still get skied into, the, uh, into my back. And, and as she says, skied into my back, which is what happened. So she's 
purposely being unpleasant here to say, that's what I said. The glasses are coming off. That's like the gloves are coming off. She's getting confrontational. She's slowing down her speech to make sure that's what happened. She doesn't see this as an inconsistency. She's not trying to hide this because what she meant, I think, is that's what happened as in the last part. I got skied into my back. Rob, for example, if I said the statement, it's possible for someone to try to text me when I'm filming this video, which is what's happening. I'm not necessarily saying someone's trying to text me. I'm saying what's happening is I'm filming this video. Does that make sense? So Gwyneth Paltrow is basically saying, which is what happened, I got skied into my back. But the lawyer thinks, aha, you just admit that you were watching your children. But she's not, and it's not throwing her off. She's like, oh my God, there's an inconsistency. People are gonna think I'm lying. She is going after her. Yep. And you just highlighted one of the objections we use quite often, which is objections compound. When a compound question is asked, the question has two parts. And the reason that's objectionable is because you don't know what the answer is being answered to, which part the question is being answered in that moment. So here you have a lawyer who walks herself into that and then isn't really picking up that she needs to walk herself back and break that up. Now, earlier we did talk about clusters of deception. And when it comes to that, I do want to say this. When she talks about the accident itself, we have a lot of conviction, direct answers. She challenges people who disagree. But when it comes to watching her children specifically, although here she wiggled out of it and said, you know, she never confirmed that part with a lot of certainty, when she was actually being asked about it, we did see a cluster of deception. We have a face touch, and face touch is one of the most researched signs of deception, especially around the nose like that. There's research from the University of Granada that shows that they did thermal scans, and they show that in stress and with deception, the blood flow in your face changes for survival, and often we see this as a result of that. Then uh, we see a grooming gesture. She fixes her hair. Uh, then her hand comes down like this and we see this kind of slightly stressful pacifying gesture. Pacifying gestures are anything we do to soothe ourselves. So we see a little bit of that, the stress is coming in. And then we see a bit of hesitancy as she's hesitating to get that, word, that answer out. There's a little bit more because usually she's like right on it. Here's a bit of hesitation. So I think when it comes to this topic, there's something about it that's stressing her out. And I don't know if it's deceptive, she's hiding something, maybe she remembers a little more about it. but. I'm less convinced personally than when she's denying uh, that she ran into Sanderson. I can add something to that because this was an interesting part for me in the testimony because it was, I mean, you caught it. She wiggled out of the answer. She didn't really give a straight yes or no. She said, I don't recall that being said, something to that effect. Well, this is a clever response because she knows that her son gave a deposition, sworn testimony prior to this, in which her son testified under oath that this was said. Mommy, watch me, watch me, watch me. That testimony is later read into court after she has testified. She's aware that this exists and it's contrary to her narrative, which might explain why she's kind of dodging the question. That 100% explains it. I'm so glad you brought that up. I wasn't aware. Uh, was that Was the kid's deposition presented in court? It was. It was read into the record. Okay, it must have been on a thing that I, I missed. I don't know when that happened. But anyways, glad you brought that up and it explains it. It explains why there's more stress around what she heard or didn't hear in that moment. I, I Listen, again, it's seven years ago, so everyone's story is to be taken with a grain of salt. But in this case, I feel like an answer that's a little more stressed than those direct denials that we're getting when it comes to the accident. May I ask how tall you are? I'm just under five. 10. Okay. I am so jealous. I think I'm shrinking though. <laughs> you and me both. I have to wear four inch heels just to make it to five five. Well, so. They're very nice. Well, thank you. So, all right. So as of right now, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. Okay. And so all of a sudden you see these two skis coming in between your yes. legs. I would have freaked out too. And I did. Okay. So Rob, I, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. W what's happening? Oh, that was for me? I'm supposed to answer that question? 
I'm supposed to answer that? I have no clue what's happening. I don't lawyer. I don't know what this is. What is this? Like they're becoming best friends or something? No, they're not. It's it's one of those things. It's it's they're playing this game of who can be more endearing to the jury in the moment. And the lawyer thinks that she's scoring brownie points and winning in this whole competition of, well, look, I can be sweet and nice. And just because they're the adverse party doesn't mean I need to be the aggressive attorney in response. Drop the act. Are you kidding me? You think I can't see? People were saying it's a fangirl moment. No, no. This is just trying to play to the jury and you think that we can't see through the BS. How tall are you? Nice shoes. My God, you're in a courtroom. Get to the question, please. Well, so here's psychologically where she trips up on this attempt to be BFFs. To me, the vibe was like the head cheerleader and then like the less popular girl trying to be like, uh -huh, I want to be cool too. And she's like, no, because later she forgets her name, remember? <laughs> here's where it backfires for her. In this attempt to try to be like, oh, I totally get it. Oh my God, you're so tall. I wish I was like you. In this attempt to connect with her, she makes a big psychological no-no. When she says... The, you, the skis came through and Gwyneth Paltrow goes, yeah, and, and I was scared, you know? She goes, I would have been too. Yep. What the hell are you doing? By saying like, oh, I, I would have freaked out too if that happened, is you're kind of acknowledging that it happened. Like I would, yeah. you know, I would, I, hey, listen, if I was in that position, I'd be freaked out too. So you're putting it in the jury's head that like, that's what happened because you would have freaked out as well. I, how is in any way that gaining points for her in her head? It's not. It's not. It, it, this is a complete oversight. I think the attorney, and this is speculation here, but the attorney is, feels in over their head. It's like the excitement of game day is there. And it is rise to the occasion and be the all-star quarterback for your team or throw 15 interceptions and get pulled at halftime. And that's what's happening. You're watching an attorney who's in the spotlight in that moment, needs to rise to the occasion and deliver a performance and is not performing. She's going to crash and burn. And I wonder if she's going to stick around to exchange information because that's the third rule. Oh, my God. The only person who says that they saw the collision was Mr. Ramon. Yes. Okay. Do you, the way you answer that makes me think that you don't believe that he saw it. I did not believe his testimony. Do you believe that he saw the collision? No. I don't believe that he saw what he thinks he saw. Ms. Paltrow, why would he lie? He said he was 40 feet away and colorblind. Well, what does colorblind have to do with anything? My husband's colorblind. We tease him all the time that he can't tell red or green. Um, but what does that have to do with not seeing who hit who? Well, if you have two people in ski gear mm -hmm. with helmets on and you're 40 plus feet away, I'm not sure how you can discern who is who. Okay. Well, and I can tell you that he didn't because Mr. Sanderson categorically hit me on that ski slope. And that is the truth. And, and I'm sure that that's what you believe. I'm not saying because that, it's the truth. I, I'm not saying that. Um, Let's get a question. <laughs> dude, after all that, that little let's get a question. I'm dude, I'm sorry. Like it's it, I no, I completely get it because that entire thing I'm watching going, why? Oh my god, it was terrible. Okay, okay, whew, calm down. Okay, listen, there's a lot in this one. And I want to start with something that for me is really, really irritating. Rob. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that on numerous occasions, you've gone skiing and snowboarding with friends of yours. Absolutely. What is the number one way that every single one of us identifies our friends on a slope? Jackets. The color of the jacket. Nobody doesn't do this. Every single person who goes to do any winter activity knows to identify their friends by the color of their jacket. You get to the bottom of the hill, you went a little bit faster, you turn around, you look at all the people skiing, you go, oh, there's my buddy, because he's wearing a yellow jacket. This lawyer hasn't skied, or if she has, she's done it once or twice as a hobby. She has no real experience, and instead of doing the smart thing and sitting down with someone who understands skiing a little and running these questions by that person, she makes a very silly assumption here in saying, what does colorblindness have to do with identifying what's going on during an accident? 
it has everything to do with identifying what's happening during an accident because without the colors, all you have is two people in snowsuits. And it's really difficult to identify. So she's really showing here that she does not have any information on what happens on a ski slope. Plus we have a jury where we probably have a couple of people who know exactly what's going on. And the moment she says that to me, it loses credibility. Do your research. The color of a snowsuit is enormously important and has nothing to do with your husband's color blindness. Rob, stop me. Let me well, let me give you a caveat here because there's a question that can be asked that would have avoided a lot of the embarrassment. You didn't know whether he was absolutely colorblind, whether he couldn't see one color, two colors, three colors. Because I have known several colorblind people that can't see reds, but they can see greens, they can see yellow, they can see blues. Why not ask the next logical question? Why go to the absolute and then bury yourself? In Smart. Well, hold on. Do we know? Because she could just come. She was in the room when uh, Craig Ramon was testifying. And when asked if he's colorblind, I'm pretty sure he just said yes. He didn't give any descriptions or caveats to say partially or anything like that. It, I'm pretty sure so far the narrative has been that he's just flat out colorblind. Yep. But no one clarified that either, which I thought was a loss on the part of the plaintiff's case, because when you have him on the stand, get the damn clarification. Find out what colors he can or cannot see, because the jury's probably sitting there asking as well. The calamity of errors in this one series of clips cannot be overstated. You never, ever, ever, in cross-examination, and I know I don't like to use absolutes, you do not ask a witness, especially a witness who's a trained actor, um, why would someone else lie? Why would he lie? Or you didn't believe. You just opened it up for her to give a narrative. What are you doing? This is your cross-examination. Control the witness. Are you kidding? And let's look at how that went for her. Because when Terry Sanderson was asked earlier uh, if Eric Christensen was lying, he said he must have been. In this case, she said, she was asked the same thing. Um, you know, do you believe he saw the collision? She says, no, not he must not have. He, I, I, it wouldn't have been that way. No. And not only does she say no, she reiterates it several times, dead into the mic. That's what happened. And when the lawyer goes, that's how you remember it, or tries to throw a little bit of kind of question marks on it, she goes, no, that's what happened. She's just like, no other narrative is acceptable. There's no ambiguity to this. It's just no. Now, again, again, we have to remember, nobody lies the same way, nobody tells the truth the same way. But I've very rarely seen people who are lying literally call out someone directly as being a liar because you just don't want that kind of heat on you. You're trying to play it cool. You're trying to be nice about it. She doesn't give a damn. She's on that stand going, no, he didn't see what he thought he saw. This is what happened. And she says it again and again and again, just direct contradiction. He is not telling the truth. All right. I don't know if he knows he's lying, but I'm telling you what he said is unfortunately not the truth. All right. So. I think she doesn't care. She's just up there going, this is what happened. Take it or leave it. Okay, Rob, I'm going to say something. Let's do a little true or false. Let's do a little true or false. Um, so something we pay a lot of attention to is head gestures during statements. So if I'm telling you a, a negative statement, like uh, I did, you know, I was never in, I, you know, I, I was never at the bar last night and you see this kind of thing. I was never at the bar last night. It's so hard to even do it. I wasn't at the bar last night. It's so bizarre. Uh, it's incongruent. It, you know, it might signal that I'm thinking like, yes, I was, or vice versa. If I go, I went to the bar yesterday, well, maybe, you know, maybe that's not happening. So in this moment, we see her say, I did not believe his testimony while her head is going, yes, like this. I did not believe his testimony. Is the following statement true or false? Her going like this while saying, I do not believe his testimony is incongruent. Therefore, she must be lying. False. Why is it false? Well, they didn't listen to the question. The question asked was asked whether this testimony given was a lie or whether she believed or didn't believe it. Gwyneth Paltrow was just affirming to the attorney that no, I did not believe the testimony. The attorney's assertion in the question was correct. Exactly. So the attorney is saying, the way you said that, it makes me believe that you don't believe that he saw it. And she's going, yeah, 
that that's what I believe. So it's context is so important. If her question was, do you believe that he saw the collision or the accident, which she immediately does, and Gwyneth Paltrow gives a completely unconditional no with a no gesture, if that was the question, I would expect to see this. But we have to be careful with this rule. Sometimes even people emphasize like this. So if I were to tell you something like, do not do this, you might get this kind of gesture. Or I might tell you something like, I love that restaurant because I'm emphasizing this. So some people have these incongruent gestures. In this case, like you said, it's not even that far of a reach. It's simply, you're correct, I don't believe him. So listen, could it be an incongruency there that something's going on in your head? It could, it absolutely could. But given the question, it's not something I'm gonna look too much into and it sounds like you're on the same page. Same. You've sat here when some of the experts have testified. Mm -hmm. We had um, Dr. Gibby and we heard uh, Dr. Fame. You, you disagree with their testimony? Absolutely, I disagree. Okay. Um, what medical training do you have to disagree with that? I'm just telling you the truth of what actually happened. Okay. <laughs> Rob, that was entirely because I wanted to see your reaction. So I'm not a lawyer, okay? I'm not a lawyer at all. But to me, it seems so bizarre that she would ask a question and after the answer be like, what qualifications do you have to answer that? I, th that was so bizarre to me. For every for every bit of criticism that I gave Steve Owens, uh, multiply that by like 10 and this question takes the cake. Are you kidding me? You're going to play that juvenile adolescent, immature jackassery in front of the jury? What medical training do you have? I don't know. Counsel, what legal training do you have? Because right now, I'm not sure. I don't understand why you would ask that question. Oh, if you thought you were scoring points, you lost. Whoa. <laughs> Wait, dude, you need to squeeze something. Where's your unicorn? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't see anyone in front of you, but you felt someone behind you? Yes. So you wouldn't possibly know, for instance, where Sanderson was coming from? No, he was behind me. I'm trying to satisfy Pardon the pr me? prior. Leading. Sustain? I'm, I'm going to tread really softly here, Rob, because I don't want to suggest that everyone has to react to something the same way. You know, we know that there are certain emotions, there are certain things that we experience that we um, express the same way, but reactions, I can't say to someone, you have to react a certain way. That being said, we've observed that Terry Sanderson is quite an expressive person. We saw him on the stand, a lot of those illustrators, when he talked about certain things that made him sad, like uh, his, his ex-girlfriend or, the nurse that was kind to him, we see the eyes of sadness, we see him emote a lot. Now, he's sitting there right now, listening to testimony that, according to him, is 100% false. What she's saying is incorrect. She's flat out saying, he was behind me. I couldn't see him was behind me. Do you see any disagreement, shock, anything where he's going, even the slightest, like kind of like, no, or looking at her like what, or confusion, or anything. The guy's just chilling, sitting there, almost waiting for his turn, almost like he knows that it's not his time, so he's just kind of waiting for it to be his time. I'm not seeing, and again, you can argue, and I would have nothing to uh, argue back if you were to say, yeah, but maybe he's just not reacting. Sure, it's possible, but this is a reactive person. He had to step out for some of the trial. Why yeah. am I not seeing anything rob i'm not even going to respond in, in terms of what i am perceiving because here's what i'm focusing on if a juror has been listening to the testimony back and forth one of those jurors in that moment could very likely glance over at mr sanderson to see how he's reacting if he is reacting that same juror might have glanced at gwyneth paltrow when paltrow was reacting these are things that feed into people's perceptions of truth and when you have a case where it's he said, she said, that means a hell of a lot to the jury that's sitting in the box.
Completely agree and I'm so glad you brought that up because her reaction when he was telling his story, it's earlier in the earlier clips where he was telling his story, we see moments of her where she's just going, no, that's not what happened. We're seeing her physical disagreement. Now again, she's an actress. She might be smart enough to go, they might be looking at me, applying what you just said, or that might just be her reaction that she's having, but that makes sense. Someone's lying about you up there. You gotta have some kind of reaction. But, but you know, fine, you don't have to. It's just for me, it kind of looks weird that it's not there. And jurors are made up of people just like you and I. There could be one on there that is perceiving it that way as well. You've described and you've kind of put with your fingers uh, how Mr. Sanderson's skis went in between yours. Do you have any explanation how somebody, if you're moving, because you were moving, right? Yes. He's moving. Yep. How somebody could, I'm just going to call it thread the needle, stick. How can somebody, as they're moving down this hill, have the ability to put their skis in between yours when they're like 18 inches apart? I don't know, but that's what happened. Okay. That's all you need. That's all you need. That's how bad the question was. That's how bad the question is. That's how bad the question is. Council. Rob, it's not even that it's a bad question. It happens all the freaking time. I'm viewing this as a lawyer. And I'm viewing this as a skier. I know. And I'm trying. I'm I the lawyer hat just right now is predominating the, the brain, and that's where my brain is. I'll think the skier thing in a minute when I get over the shock of what I just heard. As a lawyer, remember I said the thing about the open-ended questions and why you wouldn't give Gwyneth Paltrow the stage to make an emphatic statement that might be an exclamation point? Like, I don't know, it just did when you've gone through 30 seconds to lay out a hypothetical, making it sound as ridiculous as possible, but without really much to back it up other than just throwing it out there in the ether. I get it. I get the point you want to make. This ain't the way to do it. And when you make it in this convoluted way by asking this question and you get shut down by Gwyneth Paltrow, that's a rubber stamp on counsel. Please take your butt back to the counsel table, take a seat, and ice your wounds. Yep, but that's not what I saw. I mean, it's a great point. It's just not where I was stuck. Because where I was stuck is, once again, Miss, what does colorblind have to do with a ski accident? should have had a conversation with someone who skis because she's dumbfounded at this idea that someone's skis might go through someone else's skis and how is that possible first of all first of all forget accidents that's literally how you teach children to ski they put their skis inside your skis and you spread a little bit further out and they're over here and you kind of go around with them a little bit i don't know if they still do it that way maybe they came up with better techniques in the last 25 years but that's a very real way of people teaching children how to ski Regardless of that, it's very common that in an accident, if someone's coming in from behind you a little bit faster, because here's what happens. You're skiing, all of a sudden you notice there's someone in front of you and they're also skiing. Now, of course you're gonna try to avoid them. You're gonna turn to your side, you might slide and bump into them sideways, you, you know, they might fall onto you. But if I'm colliding into someone head on, at that last second I have a choice. I'm not gonna slam my skis into them, so as a reflex, either I open up like this and kind of hug them and we both go down. Or if their skis are a little further apart, and here's the thing, it's likely that her skis were further apart than his. She's skiing with children. She has to go slower. How do you go slower? You keep those skis further apart. Notice how when you watch pro skiers uh, on the slopes, their skis are close together and they're going Whereas slower skiers have their skis a little further apart because that adds friction and they could take it a little bit slower. So it's likely, given Gwyneth Paltrow's scenario, that hers are further apart. He comes in, he's going pretty fast. He doesn't have time to open up those legs. Of course his skis are very possibly going to go right through hers. And she's going to be like, holy crap, there's skis on me. And bam, she's going to get hit. So again, this lawyer is showing that she does not understand skiing. She's just using the assumptions of someone who has no experience on the slopes to comment on this. I've had people on a, on a slope all of a sudden bump into me, friends of mine or, uh, you know, family members of mine that I went skiing with. All of a sudden, you know, we're skiing a little too close, something gets out of hand. I suddenly see their skis appear. It happens. I've, 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 I've lived that.
Rob, I know, I know that with this analysis, like we had to cut it down to the most important stuff and it kind of really seems like we were very much against Terry Sanderson and very much protecting Gwyneth Paltrow. I don't want it to come off that way, although I'm, I'm aware of the fact that just in the way the stories were presented, there's a lot that seemed like he's fabricating and trying to sell a story and she's just directly answering things and laying down the facts, doesn't care what anyone thinks. Um, but, but despite that, Rob, what, what are your thoughts? What are, what are your, what's your opinion on this case? At the end of the day, there are still two narratives that don't fully line up for me. Both stories start to finish out of either participant in this case doesn't really make complete sense. You have to take some amalgamation of the two, which is the task that's going to be left to the jury to decide. With this particular case, the plaintiff had a lot of points that they left on the board. They did not score when they had the opportunity to do so with Gwyneth Paltrow's cross-examination, with Terry Sanderson going on the stand. And the defense, while I thought that they started off really slow, have picked up a lot of steam in the last few days. So this case is set to go to the jury, uh, very likely sometime Thursday afternoon, perhaps Friday morning. We'll see. That's what I'm left with. Uh, Spidey, I'm curious as to your thoughts on the trial, where you see things right now. So this is a really interesting one for me because I came into this trial for some reason, I don't know why, I came into this trial thinking that I was going to look at this and think, yeah, she bumped into this guy and, and he's, trying to make, he's trying to make some money out of it. But I thought, whether or not it's a cash grab, I thought that, first, I don't know why, I thought that this case was going to be about her being the one at fault, initially, when I came into this. But at the end of the day, when I just look at the way they're each telling their stories. With his narrative, first of all, just the narrative, I have a lot more issues with his than hers. Hers pre seems pretty straightforward. Um, second of all, him and his witness don't really seem to agree. But then we have her witness who contradicted himself a couple of times too. It's just at the end of the day, I guess it comes down to the way each story was told. With her, it's direct, here's what happened. Any contradicting information, no. And with him, it's all this fluff and all these things and all these things I'm going, that, that doesn't make any sense. Flying forward, you know, it's rare. It's hard to fall forward on skis uh, because typically your skis keep moving and you just kind of fall backwards. To fall forward, your skis would have to go uphill. You know, usually your body turns. So this whole flying forward, I had a hard time with that. The fact that his memory keeps coming and going, I had a hard time with that. The fact that he was seen doing other activities shortly after, I have a hard time with that. Um, so I just have a, a much harder time accepting his narrative. And, and I think this is actually one of the analyses where I kind of, as I looked at this, ended up forming an opinion more than other times. I usually play devil's advocate a lot. In this one, at least for me personally, I think that it's possible that they kind of both ran into each other. We talked about that. But I also, if I had to choose, if it's either this narrative or that narrative, I think I would bet my money on he ran into her. That's where I'm leaning. That's a fair take. So there it was, everyone. There was a lot to unpack. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think for me at least, one side seems like they're trying to push a narrative more than the other. Let us know in the comments what you thought. Uh, I don't know by the time this video comes up. I don't know if there was a verdict yet or not. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the jury thought of this. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this and I will see you on the next one.